Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. I welcome you back to part two of our two-week series titled Life in Ethiopia, a Travelogue. In all the years of doing this program, now in our 35th year, We've never done this subject before, and it's always exciting to do something we haven't done before. And we're very privileged to have a very special guest and a good friend, Michelle Fink, who is a businesswoman in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, she's also the president of the Human Rights Education Institute. And I should add, she's also on the board of directors of the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations. Uh, Michelle recently went to Ethiopia, and upon her return, has been very gracious to work with us. And, to bring photographs and video, and on the program today we will show you some photographs, but we'll also show you some video of children singing in Ethiopia. Uh, Michelle, welcome back from last week. We really enjoyed that program, and we look forward to this interview today. Thank you, Tony. And as always, I'm very pleased to have our regular panelist, uh, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and Janelle will commence today's questioning. Welcome back, Michelle. It was fun to talk to you last week about your trip to Ethiopia and about the information that you gathered while you were there. And this week, let's start the program by talking a little bit about what Ethiopia is like and what the people in, of Ethiopia are like. Okay. Um, in the, when, like I said, when we went in, we were in the central, central part, but we drove about seven hours south to an area uh, called Dilla. And it's very uh, green, very lush there, uh, very mountainous. It was very, actually very beautiful. Uh, the families uh, live uh, up in the hills in little kind of communities with homes, and uh, it was um, very uh, quiet, uh, very um, very easy, easygoing life, uh, so to speak, compared to ours. And uh, it was uh, it was quite a pleasurable trip, actually. Is Ethiopia a large country? It is about the size of Texas, plus uh, maybe Oklahoma or something. It's uh, a little bit larger than that. And it's pretty good sized. It's warm, I take it. Yes, very warm. <laughs> and dry. Uh, parts of it. And Dilla was actually um, green and it rained a little bit. They have a rainy season. Uh, parts of it are very dry though now. Uh, but the particular area that we were at was uh, uh, quite green. And is Ethiopia a, a populated country? It is. I don't know the population, but um, the capital, Addis Ababa, was about 5 million people. And the area of Dila we were in was about 200,000. Um, and those were just two of the areas. So, um, but I, I believe it is quite populated. We don't have a map with us. And uh, oftentimes we show a map. But of course, Ethiopia is in Africa. And would you kind of describe whereabouts in Africa is or, or the, the neighbors around Ethiopia? Uh, it's in the Horn of Africa. Uh, Kenya is to the south. Um, and uh, so it's, I guess if you turn Africa sideways, you'll see it in the in the Horn area there. So it's in the uh, eastern, northern eastern part of Africa. I told our viewers last week that if they came back this week, we would show them more slides or photographs. And uh, we're going to go through 12. And we have a little video with this, too. And uh, at this time, I'll ask our staff to put up on the screen the first photograph. And Michelle will take us through. It's a, a way of you traveling with us to uh, Ethiopia through these. And Michelle, would you describe this first photograph? Yeah, this is one of their homes. Uh, this is a, kind of behind a little fence. They um, generally kind of have a little uh, area that they call their own. And so you can kind of see the fencing in the, in the front there. And they make it out of whatever they have. Um, they have a couple different types of housing. Um, but they use the local vegetation and, um, for their fences and housing in this area. And it is uh, proof to the point that if it rains and all, it's still dry within their home. Um, yeah, it, it, most of it's because they put layers of, of leaves and, and um, set it up there so it'll run off. But obviously it's uh, not quite like our, our home, so course, it, it could... Some parts of the country doesn't have rain, other parts it does. <laughs> True. Uh, I believe we have a second one here of a, a home, which is a little more, what would you call, sophisticated home or... A little better, bit. well built. Yeah. Um, this is another typical, you see these two different kinds of homes um, all over in the area that we went. Um, they use uh, whatever they have as far as the um, poles, and then they 
you can see it's kind of a red uh, clay dirt. I was going to say the walls are some kind of red clay. Or... Exactly, and then they, they use again the thatch type roof on that. And then they also kind of make these in a square style. So both of those are pretty So you, you have them both in the round and in the square. Exactly. Is it all one room or are they different rooms? They do kind of have a, a room, maybe two rooms, usually with maybe a curtain of some sort. Uh, in the ones that we went in. We actually didn't go into a round home like this, but we were in a couple of the little square ones. And, and the, what, they have this beds on the floor? or how it's, Yeah, it's, they kind of have a mat, uh, like a woven mat for the flooring, and um, usually a bench type uh, seating. And a little table. And a little table and benches that they make out of wood. And, and they can cook within those. They have, what kind, how do they do the cooking? Yeah, the kitchens are quite interesting. <laughs> They, um, they do either outdoors or indoors, but they do just cook. Um, they don't have stoves like we do, obviously, so they make do with little teeny fires and put the pot right on the fire. And, and our third photograph, again, is a, a, a number of the people in Ethiopia. Yeah, these ladies are actually doing their laundry. Uh, they're, um, but as you can see, whenever we would pull out our camera, they would um, stop and we could take photos. And so they're, you can see they've got the laundry there in front of them and they're up on a stream. So they, they wash their clothes in a stream. Exactly. Yeah. And there's some photos that we're not showing that I, that I saw with you, and they kind of use maybe even rocks and all mm -hmm. to kind of like scrub the clothes and, <clears throat> and get them clean. Exactly. In rural areas in the United States years ago, that's what they used to do in this country, too, in the more rural areas. Yeah. So. I kind of felt like I was back about 200 years ago in the, in yeah. the States. Yeah. yeah. It was, an, was it not actually 200 years ago in some places. That's true. Uh, in the fourth photograph, yeah, this is a rock quarry, and this is like right off the side of the road again. Um, in the little hotel that we stayed at in Dilla, they had um, the whole courtyard area and, and kind of paved road where we were drove in was rock. And um, that's what they're doing. They're pulling the rock out of the side of the hill, and then they'll sell it or distribute it and use it for paving purposes and maybe for bases on their homes and things. So that's, that's the two main purposes for the roads or for around their homes. Mm -hmm. And the fifth photograph, I believe it's a... a it has to do with commerce and banking. Yes, this is the bank we um, exchanged our money in. The first bank we went to wouldn't exchange our, our American money, but um, this bank is quite large, I believe, in Ethiopia, and so we, um, it was quite a process to, to even, exchange our money. Even Western Union was there. <laughs> it was. <laughs> the sign is right there, yes. And it's, it's, it's run, is it state-run bank? Uh, it's, it's, right, it's, it's run by the state. Um, they are quite the same kind of banking laws that we would have here, but we had to show our passports, and they actually didn't take all my money. They, I guess, thought it wasn't good, so they gave a few of the bills back and had to exchange them for some more appropriate. And I assume that they don't have this, the technology is not as modern as our banking system. No, it was all by hand. <laughs> it was by hand. You couldn't instantly wire it. To... No. Okay. And then the sixth photograph. And these are these are some of the women that are in the program. We would meet with them in groups and then individually. And um, this was after our, our interview process with them, and they were sitting out on the church steps. And so. uh, Janelle had indicated about clothing, and this is an example. Is this typical clothing that the women wear? Yeah, they have the Western clothes underneath, and then a lot of times when they go to a function like this, they would, um, or even just if you see them walking on the streets, they'd wrap it with a scarf. Um, I think this is an appropriate time while we're seeing this photograph. <clears throat> uh, weather conditions and uh, tell us about it. W wearing those particular clothes would not, not be very at times very hot to be wearing those kind of clothes? <laughs> it, it was to me. Um, we, uh, you know, we didn't wear shorts or anything like that. It was a very conservative country but um, th I thought that a lot. It was a layer and I would thought I would have been very warm. It was probably in the 80s or higher and the humidity was quite high in this area. So, um, but it didn't seem to bother them. They they, they layered, to, yeah. Yes. And the seventh photograph. And this is a typical uh, area we would drive up into the hills. This is exactly what it would look like, the little dirt roads, and there would be homes off to the sides. Um, so, this And then you can see the vegetation is... Very, very green here in this part. Yeah, it was beautiful. This actually, I believe, was taken in Kircha, which is a little bit farther south even um, than Dilla. We drove down and we visited a couple different areas. Very plush um, and... And some people just live on the hillsides, and, and it's hard to to observe, unlike a city, how many people there might be. Exactly. I, while we're looking at this one, I know that there was one point that you were driving on a road, and you got so bad you couldn't pass, and you had to stop. Is that right? Yeah, we uh, we parked the van, and uh, our uh, guide said, "Well, it's only like five or ten minutes up this road." 
<laughs> so we said, okay, we'll walk. Well, we were at about 8,000 feet, and um, it was hot. And it was not five or 10 minutes. It was more like 20 minutes. Um, all the little uh, kids were running after me and laughing. But um, because the altitude was so high, we did. We walked about 20. And so you can see how great a shape they would be in because yes. they walk everywhere. It was yes. hard on us, even the people that were in better shape than me. It was That's hard why the on them. children were laughing. They were laughing, yes. <laughs> Our eighth photograph. This is kind of an overview of uh, the area again. You can see the little hut in the front, the, the roof of the hut. This is up in the mountains. We, it was quite high there. Um, and you can see the wasa again, uh, plants behind there. I would imagine it could get cold at night at this height. A little bit, but not, not, not real not, cold. Not, a little chilly. This is far yeah. south as Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And then our ninth photograph. This is a coffee processing plant. And like I said, coffee is the number one product in Ethiopia. and a lot of the women are in the program. Uh, in the upper left corner, you can see they're kind of a, a higher area there. It's got tables in there. They would actually drive the trucks up there. Uh, tables would be gone. They'd dump the coffee down into the big cement vats there, and there's water in there. So they'd wash it, and then they'd run through the process there of the, the uh, cement running down there, and then they'd pull it out and dry it and clean it, and those tables would be set out in the, in the fresh air, and they'd be sun-dried. So, um, they have a lot of these. You see these all over the hillside, these processing plants. Now, I believe you indicated that some American companies are involved with the coffee production. There is one here. I don't know the exact name, but actually local that actually own In this the particular. Area. Mm -hmm. They own this particular coffee plant. And now we're going to see one of the products here. This is this is a coffee plant, uh, kind of up close. And um, I don't know how many people knew. I didn't know what it looked like prior. Those little buds there are will turn into the coffee buds and then they'll uh, turn into the coffee. They're green when you actually get coffee and then it's roasted and that's how we get it roasted and ground. So this is uh, uh, actually right next door to that coffee processing plant we were just at. So I assume they drink a lot of coffee because they have They do. It's really that. good. Yeah. Except the next one is shows the lady, I believe she is working on the, on the production itself. This is a, the wasa plant. She is scraping the meat off the wasa plant, and that's what the, uh, or the wasai plant, and it's called wasa when they use it, and that's what they, one of their staple foods. We're going to pause. You have some video here. We want to see how, how hard a work it is doing what she's doing. If they will show that video right now, you can, it's about nine <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I know, Solomon. I think she's so good. You. I first did hit in the car. You mm -hmm. need a band aid. I would suggest that would be a good way of getting in shape. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And here's our final photograph. And this again is uh, where they're doing their wash up and you can see the bicycle there. They, they do have some bicycles. Uh, they are very expensive for the locals to buy. And you can see the laundry lane up there. They just lay it out on the rocks to dry. And um, A minute ago we showed a photograph of the, of the women and the clothes, but here we can see a more clear photograph of the actual washing of the clothes. Um, and water is a very precious thing everywhere. But particularly in Ethiopia. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, there are no wells, there's no running water in most of their homes, no water, no electricity. So they've got to go out here to the streams and um, use what they can. We also saw <clears throat> last week's show um, um, hauling a barrel of water with a uh, leaf pool by um, a cart. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Janelle Burke. All of this is very interesting and you traveled around by car, I take it, or by vehicle. But most of the people probably walk. Can you tell us something about the transportation systems in Ethiopia and how they might differ from the urban to the rural areas? Mm -hmm. they, they do have a transportation system. Um, it was kind of interesting because we had a, a white Toyota van that we were in, and it was very typical of some of the local transportation that they could find. So they would try to hail our, our van down for a ride, and I always felt bad because we'd drive right by them. Uh, so uh, they did have some van. They also had some blue and white taxis, some small, um, all their cars are, are older cars, and they're quite expensive, actually. Um, in, in the big city of Addis, they had a bus system, and they also had some van system. And I asked our guide, I said, well, how do they know where the vans are going? Because there's no signs on them like we would have. And he said, well, they just stop and ask them. And if they're going in the direction they want to go, they get in, um, and they're all packed. Uh, and then they also had a big white like open-ended uh, one-ton pickup type truck that you'd see a lot of and uh, mostly men would take that and they'd just be standing in the back of the truck and driving down the road. 
And they have roads that are paved. They have mm -hmm. one. <laughs> and, and they also have uh, roads that go up into the hills, like the dirt road that we saw in the picture. Um, many people walk, of course. Uh, what other kinds of things do they do? Let, let's say you're an older person or someone who cannot walk well. Mm -hmm. What kind of transportation would you use if you were out in those rural areas? Yeah, if you, donkey? If you had a donkey, um, we saw um, the cart we saw, they'd maybe ride on a cart. Um, they walk, even the older people. I mean, um, if they don't have another mode to get there, they either don't go or they walk, or they might take a, a, a donkey if they have one. Not everyone owns uh, even an animal, so um, they just do what, and, but they help. Their neighbors help. Um, you know, there's bicycles. Did you see There bicycles? are some bicycles. Um, they are quite expensive. Um, it may be difficult to ride up and down very steep hills. It, that too. <laughs> I wouldn't ride one up there, but you'd see them a little bit on the main roads. Um, it, it wasn't a uh, overly um, used form of transportation, but uh, some of the young people, and if you could afford one, you would see bicycles. President Bill Clinton, after leaving the office, it created a foundation, and, and very much like Jimmy Carter is doing work around the world, and one of his projects that he's so committed to is dealing with combating AIDS in Africa and over in Asia. Uh, and in some parts of those sections of the world, AIDS has been very devastating. There's as much as 25 percent of the population is affected in some way. A lot of orphans uh, with parents have died. Uh, what is the condition in Ethiopia in relation to the AIDS uh, epidemic? Yeah, it's, um, it's there. Um, it is kind of a hush subject in some circles if you have um, what I heard is if you have a family member or something that maybe dies of AIDS they don't say that they died from that um, we did go to an orphanage in Addis Ababa and um, there were quite a few um, babies in the orphanage and there were a few of them there that were infected with the HIV virus so um, it is there I did see some uh, billboards and things you know with uh, precautionary uh, messages and things on them. Um, but other than that, uh, I don't know what exactly they're doing to help uh, the population to educate and, and you know, inform them and combat that. That's been one of the challenges in a number of the countries is convincing the government that they need to have a very, very aggressive campaign of, of information and preventive methods. And I, that's one of the things that the Clinton Foundation is working very much on um, in relation to that. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't take some of the photos that you had and put on about the children in the orphanages because you did have some. And, and uh, can you tell us a little bit more about um, uh, were the, the, those that you visited, where there were several children there, and how are those orphanages run or administered? Yeah, they have several there. We went to a Catholic orphanage. Um, it was during the school time, so some of the children weren't there. We uh, visited kindergarten class, and they sang to us also, which was really cute. There were a few kids there that were a little bit older, maybe 8, 10. They were um, so glad to see us. They wanted to play, and, and we played games with them and, and threw them around and, you know, kind of had fun with them. Um, then they had the toddlers, and they had the babies. Uh, we spoke with the, um, the sister that ran the orphanage, and um, she pointed out quite a few children that, well, babies mostly that were um, going to be adopted that were already uh, spoken for. The process, I, I, I understand, is pretty lengthy, but, um, and they had a lot of children there, uh, you know, a few hundred children at this one particular orphanage, and they had quite a few more in the city, so. And are they available for adoption both in and outside the country? They are, and according to what the sister was telling me is um, you have to kind of start that process here and, and work your way through the channels and then in fact, when we, the first night we got to Addis, we stayed in a guest house in the capital before we left. And when we got up in the morning, there was a young couple there that had just adopted a baby. I believe they were from the Netherlands or somewhere up there. And um, so they were sitting on the front lawn with their little new baby boy. So it, it, it can be done, and a lot of children are adopted, but the process is probably quite lengthy. Thank you. Janelle Burke. I want to ask some questions in this round about medical care and lifespans in Ethiopia. Can you enlighten us, please? That's a, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, in Addis, they obviously have you know hospitals and things. In the area we were at in Dilla, you would see kind of a clinic every once in a while. Uh, we travel quite a distance. Uh, we had an incident um, 
in fact, when we were uh, doing the Wasa plant, that our executive director got stung by a bee, and it you know really made you think about the medical care there, uh, because had he had a reaction, we were nowhere near a facility that, that could have helped him, and um, there really isn't uh, much. It's more like. Um, you know, one doctor's office per town kind of thing, and it's, you know, like the clinics you'd see set up. And it, after that, I, it was kind of at the end of our trip, I hadn't really thought about it a whole lot, but it, it really made you think um, that what would, you know, they don't have that available, and um, so it's not like we can just run to the doctor like we do here. And if you get a catastrophic illness, you're probably um, not able to get medical care that's likely to deal with that catastrophe. Yeah, actually one of our... Uh, people that is involved in the programs had a child that just passed away just recently and it was a sudden illness and um, yeah so it's definitely a real reality for them they're just um, no diagnostics no treatments and what about lifespans do men and women there live as long as we do um, and obviously if they don't have care and they have some of these illnesses or something happens that they need medical care and can't get it uh, they probably don't live as long as we do here. Yeah, I understand the lifespan somewhere around 35, 40 years uh, generally. Really? We did meet some people that were older, obviously, but um, mm -hmm. I think as a whole, uh, due to the lack of diagnostics and being able to treat, um, like, you know, if you think about it, how many times have we been to the doctor for something that, if not helped, could have been, you know, pretty devastating to people, so. Well, certain things like pneumonia and, and perhaps even being inoculated against childhood diseases uh, doesn't occur in with regularity there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm sure they don't. I know there's, you know, different organizations that do that throughout the world with different things, but it doesn't happen on a regular basis. And do women have their babies at home? They do, uh, especially in that area, and um, uh, it, it can be quite, I mean, you think back a hundred years or whatever here, I mean, now we just run to the doctor if we, or go to the hospital and they don't have that facility, so it can be quite devastating a lot of times if there's complications for them. I want to follow up on Janelle's question and deal with, again, uh, not only lack of medical intervention. Uh, we saw on the show last week a photograph of uh, uh, two turkeys. Uh, I have some questions to deal with wildlife, uh, and that comes to the safety question again, too. Do they have poisonous snakes uh, in the area? You know, I don't think they do. I think they, um, that was one thing we didn't have to worry about. And it was interesting. I didn't see, I expected there to be more um, insects and things. And of course, we had to get a variety of shots and inoculations and malaria medicine and that. Um, where we were at, it wasn't real bad, like mosquitoes and things. Um, they have, uh, uh, you know, that part of it, I didn't, it didn't uh, appear to be uh, a problem. And then uh, as to wildlife, uh, we did a show with one of our mutual friends, uh, two shows actually, with Lorraine Landwehr, when her, she and her spouse went to South Africa. And they did traveling all over the country and uh, beautiful wildlife, large animals, you know, lions and um, tigers and uh, elephants and so forth. Did you see any large uh, animals? Yeah, we didn't. We were, we were discussing that prior to the show. Um, you think of that when you think of Africa. We, we saw a camel. And, um, but a lot of the wildlife that we saw, or animals that we saw, were domesticated animals in the area. We used a lot of goats, a lot of people have goats for milk. Um, they have the, the cows or steers for, for meat and so forth. And um, we saw some ostriches and emus and things like that, but we weren't, I don't know, fortunate or unfortunate enough to see a lion or, or anything large like that, but. Nothing, and certainly this trip uh, emphasized that. Uh, you talked about religion somewhat on the last show, and uh, you identified Christian, I would, say, I would assume more of the Western Christian, uh, like the Catholic faith and all, and then the Orthodox Christians and the Muslims. In some countries, there's a real divide and divisiveness between religions. Did you find that in Ethiopia that they live more in harmony and peace between the religions? Or did, it, did that come up in your discussion? You know, it didn't come up a lot. We were um, obviously with a lot of the people from the Christian-based Calhoun Church. So, um, and like I said, it's, they, they are actually quite involved in their faith. I mean, you wouldn't, um, even if you go to church here, you're not, it, it's their life. It, it's what keeps them going. They're very religious people. They're very religious people. And then the Orthodox Church um, is uh, Christian-based, but they have their, it's kind of a cultural thing with them, I believe. And then the Muslims, I didn't see anything other than we were at uh, 
uh, the, the fancy Sheraton Hotel in Addis with um, uh, exchanging some money and we had a couple of people in there. One was uh, um, they were discussing the uh, Middle East uh, crisis and, and everything and I was like, okay, I'm going to go now. But they, they weren't, they weren't, they were discussing it a little bit loudly but they weren't angry. Um, but I don't know that they could uh, solve the problems of the world in that one discussion. But In some places in Africa there's a great divide between the religions and, mm -hmm. and uh, even uh, violence and conflict in some of the countries yeah. between the forces and certainly in the Middle East we know that's true. And I was just interested that it apparently is not of that uh, it didn't appear to of, be of seriousness. Yeah, it didn't appear to be where we were at. Yeah. But I think there are parts of Ethiopia that it's more. Yeah. We're about out of time. In a minute, we're going to show some video. But uh, of the contact to people who might be interested in this, I believe there's a contact in Spokane. Uh, and would you give that, please? It's an international assistance program, and you can see his name on the screen. William Rowe is the president, and his number is 509-466-5562. And if you give that number one more time. 509-466-5562. And if people contact them, they can get other information, brochures or information that you would need. I want to introduce the closing of our program, and it's uh, going to take a minute. But uh, when Michelle came to us, she brought video. And one of the things that I thought was most impressive was that at one of their stops, they had uh, the children that greeted them with song. and. We all know that music is a very powerful international way of communicating. And Michelle, very quickly, if you could introduce what these children were doing. Yes, they were um, after a church service we went to, and we were getting ready to leave. And the people are so gracious, they always offer you a soda yeah. or something. And these little children decided to uh, sing us a song as we were leaving. And so what we're going to do here in a moment is we're going to have it's kind of a song of thank you or a song of greeting. Uh, from the children to your whole group. Mm -hmm. And we thought we would uh, play this and go off the air with it. It's, it's our gift to our viewers of the children from Ethiopia. We'll do that now. Thank you. 